yeah, we're doing five themes in Mark tonight. And uh, the notes should be there. And uh, I think we're due to start in about a minute or two. So I'll say good day. Um, I was going to say I'll tell a joke, but I can't think of anything. Oh, Greg got the notes. Fabulous. That's wonderful. Thanks for letting me know. Um, yeah. Shall we get started? Let's get started. Uh, we'll open and pray. Loving God, we pray you'd open our minds and our hearts to what you would have us learn, that we might read your scriptures more deeply and know your presence in our lives more deeply. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So, um, today we're doing the five themes in Mark. Uh, and... Same as if you saw the five themes in Matthew, same thing. Theme one actually isn't a theme. Uh, it's more the overarching structure, if you will. And it's just important to point out that the central theme of the Gospels is Jesus. Um, and, and the reason I want to start with that is it's so easy to think that Mark might be about other things, uh, but we need to focus on those other things uh, kind of in, in how Jesus deals with them and how we are to interpret them through the life of Jesus, those sorts of things. So the central, dominant, most important theme in the Gospels is Jesus. And in fact, uh, it's Christ crucified. It's Jesus on the cross. If you have the notes, uh, you'll see there that I've got sort of top left page a depiction of the two source hypothesis. Oh, good evening. Um, so if you've got the notes, the two source hypothesis, uh, and what that says is if you look at the first three gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They have a lot in common, as well as some unique components. And the two-source hypothesis is probably the most widely accepted academically. And what that says is that Matthew and Luke had two sources in common, Mark and Q, which stands for Quella, which is German for sayings, is my recollection. And then Matthew and Luke each have independent sources as well. Um, you'll notice that Mark is independent entirely. And we'll get to this in a bit. Mark is the first of the Gospels written down. So the first uh, thematic point, and part of this is about when we read the Gospels, we're often trained to read just little bits. You know, in, in church on a Sunday, we'll read this little parable or that little piece of teaching and we miss the the sort of the broad narrative structure that mark has provided us so um the first thing to look at in this particular instance is the structure and one thing to do is to look at about the middle mark uh, got Matthew on the notes. Gosh, gosh, I need to change that. Mark 8, 31. What happens is Jesus predicts his own death. Uh, and this is a transitional moment because prior to this, uh, Jesus has been just about the only active participant. He's been the miracle worker. He's been the storyteller. He's been the teacher. He's been the one who's been driving everything. After this moment, we start to see that it's about, in essence, training the disciples to be like him, to see the world in the way he sees it. Now, they don't always get it right. Uh, in fact, frequently they get it wrong. Um, but when we read Mark's gospel, it's important to have a, a picture as to, is it in the first half where we're going to be seeing Jesus modeling things? 
or is it in the second half where we see how that modeling works itself out in the lives of the disciples? Uh, so I'm just going to move that a tiny bit. There we go. So, so um, that's a kind of a theme there, just in terms of the structure. The next theme is uh, is that it's taking the picture of Son of God or Messiah, and Son of God is a messianic title. It's not the only title, but it's a messianic title. And it's saying instead of uh, looking at this through the lens of culture, use Jesus as the lens to interpret what it means to be Messiah. So you might be familiar. You might be familiar with um, uh, that in the time of Jesus, there was what was called a messianic expectation. Uh, and that messianic expectation was about a Messiah rising to reform the kingdom of Israel, the kingdom of David, based in Jerusalem. And in order to do that, the Messiah would need to be a military leader who would gather together soldiers who would throw the Romans out of Jerusalem or perhaps overthrow them entirely and, um, <clears throat> and, and establish a new uh, geopolitical kingdom based in Jerusalem. And Jesus is working with a di very different picture of what it means to be Messiah. And the beginning of Mark's Gospel gives us a clue in a sense that this is what it's about. But it's about reimagining what it means to be a Messiah. Uh, and if you look at in the Gospels, you'll see that there are two groups that talk about uh, Jesus as the Son of God. Uh, um, and the first group gives a sort of, in a sense, tells us how we should be picturing this messianic uh, expectation, this what it means to be the Son of God. Um, and I've got two scripture passages there to look at, but there are a few others as well. Um, I just picked these two. So the first one I picked is Mark chapter 1, 9 to 11. And the text is there in the notes, and uh, it's from the NRSV. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. So there we get God, God's own voice, confirming Jesus as Son of God. In baptism, in, in going through the water and emerging uh, again. Um, and, the, and the other example that I picked is from Mark chapter 15, 39. And it's just after Jesus died on the cross. Now, when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was God's son. You see, the true attestations, the true telling us what it means to be Messiah, um, point to not a political, geopolitical, but a character that enters into the world and is willing to go even to the cross. Now, there's some false attestations as well. There's false pictures of Messiah. And I say false, and they're not false, but they are muddying the waters. Uh, and so this is, if you, um, there's an example there uh, where, where Jesus has been uh, healing people, demoniacs. Oh, hey, Danny's joined us. G'day, Danny. Um, uh, and uh, he, and when the unclean spirits see him, they fall down before him and they shout, you are the Son of God. Why would they shout that? Now, technically they're right, of course. Uh, they, 
but they're shouting it because they, there's this idea that if the audience hears that Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah, they're going to come with all the incorrect cultural baggage that they've been bringing. So much of uh, Mark's gospel is about reframing what it means to be the Messiah, the Son of God. And it's taking it away from a, a political picture uh, to um, a, uh, a um, kind of a more, more spiritual in that it's a responsive to God. Oh, David, you're having some problem with, with the notes. Um, there's a link uh, sort of that I posted at about six o'clock. And of course, the notes are also on the website under the sermons and series section. Uh, hopefully that'll help. Uh, or you can just listen and get the notes afterwards. I, I'll, I'll try and speak to everything that's on the notes. So, um, yeah, so we've got true attestations and false attestations. And the false attestations are there to muddy the waters. Jesus, Jesus is the lens by which we should be looking at what it means to be the Messiah, not our cultural expectations. Next thing. I feel like we're cranking along here. Um, so, uh, I think it's important to look at the, kind of the context and the date uh, and, and the original audience as much as possible. Uh, and, and that should always hopefully tell us something. The date. Um, probably before 70 AD, but only a little bit before. So, let's say 60 to 70 to be conservative. Uh, you know, during a time of political ferment, during a time of a crisis, uh, it's during the time when the Jews are gearing up to rebel against the Romans, um, but there hasn't been that crushing of the Jewish rebellion and the destruction of the temple. So that's roughly the time, which if you think about it, means that Jesus' disciples, sort of the people who were his followers, um, they're alive. Well, his close followers have most, mostly been martyred, but there were people who were in the crowds around Jesus who were going, yeah, yeah, I remember that Jesus fella. Uh, he was great. He was a good talker. He told some great stories. Um, we, we're in well within uh, a single lifetime. Uh, and even an adult, you know, uh, we're, we're not talking child to, to adult or, or infant to adult. We're talking a, an adult. Um, so that's the first thing. However, after that, it starts to get a bit fuzzy. You know, um, people suggest perhaps it was written in the Decapolis or Galilee. So that's just a little bit north of Jerusalem. Uh, some people are suggesting in Rome, uh, where the church ends up kind of basing itself later on, or some people say Syria. It's actually probably quite relevant that uh, there's not a lot of cultural background information. Well, one, because it's based on the life of Jesus. Um, and it's also intended as a very universal text. Uh, it's not for just that group of disciples who are in the Decapolis or, or those people who are based in Jerusalem. Mark is writing for all who are followers uh, of the Son of God. Um, so, so, yes, the very lack of detail is probably quite important. Um, the first part of Mark's Gospel demonstrates how we should be as disciples of Christ. Uh, and the, de the model is Jesus. Uh, and the second part shows the disciples attempting to live into that. Alexander Shire, whom I don't know his work particularly, I've just come across it a little bit, uh, suggests that we should see the miracle of the calming of the storm, which is the first miracle that involves the disciples as, in a sense, recipients of the miracle. Does that make sense? So they've been there, they've seen healings, those sorts of things. But this is the first time they are recipients. They are direct beneficiaries of an act of God uh, as being normative 
for how we should approach things. Uh, and in Mark, there's no guarantee that things are going to go well for the disciples. In fact, you know, knowing how the story goes, we know that following Christ, in Christ's case, living as Christ, leads to the cross. Um, but the passage reminds us that the, that the point of faith is that, to a certain extent, it precludes fear. So I've got the little passage for you there, uh, and I'm going to read it for you. But I want to start uh, with a little bit of kind of word study moment here. Um, if you're not familiar with it, uh, almost every word in the Bible, you can look up a translation from it and using what's called Strong's Concordance, and it's online. Uh, and the word faith is pistus, uh, and it's, it's understood as a gift from God. So it's not to do with what do you think, or are you convinced about something, or, or have you been convinced of this? Rather, faith is a gift. Uh, it's to do, you know, it's connected to belief or confidence, but those, in a sense, in a sense arise from a person, faith is a gift from God. So Mark 4, 35 uh, onward. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great gale arose and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion, and they woke him up and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased and there was a dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? So, so it's not that there is no storm in life, but rather that by faith we travel, in a sense, through the storm. And um, as I said, historical context, it was, in the, it was written in the middle of a very stormy time. Uh, it was written, as I said, as the Jews were just starting to rebel against the Romans. Uh, and it's, it's a very different picture of what it means to be Messiah people of God, kingdom of God, that is trying to paint a different picture that says, you know, it's not about rebelling against the Romans and establishing a geopolitical system. Uh, it's about um, leading a particular life, recognizing that that might lead to the cross, but it's a life in response to God. Uh, so, so yeah, um, so that's its context as much as we know but it's important also to recognize that it's that it's its context is now us yeah yeah does that make sense it's context where it's new context because it's uh yeah it's it's the story of jesus for all time i hope that makes sense uh so the next theme the next theme is connected to all the others, and it's about upside-down power. The text on this, apparently, uh, is a book by Ched Myers called Binding the Strong Man, a political reading of Mark's story of Jesus. And um, I've only skimmed bits and pieces of it, but I tell you what, it's quite confronting in terms of encouraging us to see how power is still operating in the world you know you don't you don't want to uh yeah so i i, I would recommend it to you if you get a chance to have a look and kind of really get into some of the meaty uh, interpretive cultural stuff um so yeah okay so this thing about uh the upside down power of that's depicted in the kingdom of God, in, in, in um, yeah, by Jesus. Um, 
And I thought I'd pull out two examples. We, we've hardly spoken about the parables till now. So um, I wanted to, to pull out these two. Um, the one is the, where Ched Meyer gets the title for his book. And it's Mark chapter 3, uh, verse 27. And Jesus is teaching, he says, But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then indeed the house can be plundered. Which is a weird parable, isn't it? I mean, it's a weird story for Jesus to be telling. Um, particularly in a historical context where the strong man was the, the one to be lauded, to be admired. And Jesus is going, well, no, you just get some rope and tie him up and you, he's fine, he's, he's nothing. And his possessions are, are, are no longer his. Um, and it's this weird story of subverting the picture of power. So, um, and as I said, uh, the other one, the other one uh, that I wanted to share with you uh, is, is actually one of my favorite parables. Um, and there's a version of it that's, that you tell in Godly Play, which is just beautiful. Um, and it's about the parable of the mustard seed. So also Jesus, he also said, and this, sorry, Mark chapter 4, 30 to 32. I should always give my references, shouldn't I? He also said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which, when sown upon the ground, is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs, and puts forth large branches, so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. Um, and I love that, because it's... You know, we don't often think of it this way, but it, it is, you know, a tiny seed. Now, I, I think it's, I mean, it's technically not the smallest of all seeds, but it is pretty small, right? Uh, and it grows into the shrub, but it's an incredibly counterintuitive parable for the kingdom of God. If in your mind you have a kingdom as a castle and soldiers with swords and spears and and taxes and uh, all those sorts of things and and armies who prepare for war here the picture is the opposite it's it's a it's a it's a, it's a shrub and it's not only just a shrub that is kind of useful but it's a shrub that is useful to all these birds that can come from all over the place and make their nests. So that's a very upside down picture of power. Then the other one I wanted to look at was the disciples. Now we often talk about the, you know the twelve disciples and uh, you know they followed Jesus and they, he was founding as you know uh, you know Peter and you I will uh, build the church and all the rest of it. And clearly they played an, played an important role. Um, but uh, it was pointed out, um, and I forgot to put a reference to this. Where did I find this one? Uh, oh, Daniel Kirk, uh, in, a, in a speech of his I was listening to, a presentation of his I was listening to, points out that the good disciples in uh, Mark's gospel aren't... Peter or or any of the others or John or, or or James or any of them they are often depicted as as not quite getting it you know they, they have the argument who's going to sit at your right hand and your left hand um, you know who's going to be two I see in the kingdom of God uh, you know and and um, if you think about it on his, Jesus left and right hand are as he enters into the kingdom in a sense, are two prisoners being executed along with him. Um, so left and right hand is not the place you want to be. Um, but the ones who get it are the nameless women. And the example I've got is Mark chapter 1. So right at the beginning of Mark's gospel, uh, verse 30 and 31. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever. 
And they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. You see, she's a good disciple because she gets it. Grace has been offered, in this case healing, and the immediate correct response is service. Uh, and it's not service to Jesus, it's service. That's what a good disciple of Jesus does, is respond to the grace of God by acting in loving service to the world, to the world, to those in need, to those who are hungry. And the final theme, I said five themes, I said five themes, uh, we're going to get this done in just about half an hour, which is pretty quick, coming back to the crucifixion. Um, and it's, there's this question, there's this question, and I can't remember where I first heard it, but I think it's a great question to ask. And it's, is the crucifixion a chapter in the story of the resurrection, or is the resurrection a chapter in the story of the crucifixion? Now, in one sense, perhaps you might think it doesn't matter. Mark's gospel raises the stakes slightly in that um, the most uh, confident component of Mark's gospel doesn't have an actual resurrection scene. It alludes to the resurrection, but it doesn't have an actual resurrection scene. Uh, so if you want to Wikipedia it, you're looking for the short ending of Mark. Um, but the reason I say that uh, in Mark, the answer is that the resurrection is a chapter in the story of the crucifixion is because in it, Christ is modeling a life which can well, and in his case does, lead to crucifixion. It is, it's about entering fearlessly with faith into the storms of life, using the storm miracle as the kind of the model uh, that uh, Alexander Shire uh, suggests. Uh, Mark's gospel, and, and, and as I say, it was written in a stormy time. It was written in a stormy time. Uh, it's about entering into a life, entering into a picture of the kingdom of God, which leads to potentially crucifixion. It is about that kind of life. Whew. There's my five themes in Mark's gospel in roughly half an hour. As I said, my notes are on Facebook um, in a post which should be just below the video. Uh, they're also on the website under sermons and series. Um, and uh, is anyone who's got any questions? And I'll see if I can address it straight away. Uh, yeah. How are we going? I'll scroll back through the comments and just see if there's anything there that um, uh, I hadn't responded to. Oh, we had a goodly number of people log on and say good day and, and are watching. Um, I don't see anyone posting any questions, so I will uh, I'll finish with with uh, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you, Ren. Bye-bye.